as we said before, we're going to take a little bit closer look into Newton's third law as well. So what we're going to do is we're going to actually look at this powerful statement relating the orbital period to the orbital distance. The square of the orbital period is proportional to the cube of the orbital distance. So when we look at this, r in our cases is the orbital uh, distance. This is the semi-major axis. t is our orbital period. And the normal way that most people will see Kepler's third law is relating one orbit at one radius to a second orbit at a second radius. So say we know what the Earth orbits, we know its radius, and we look at Mars and look at the orbit, orbital period of Mars, we can now figure out the orbital distance of Mars. So this is a powerful, powerful concept. Or if we know that Halley's Comet, uh, comet is uh, orbiting the Sun, we're orbiting the Sun, so we can figure out what our semi-major axis is in our orbital period of one year, figure out what the period of Hale, uh, Halley's Comet is, uh, and we can figure out what is how far out Halley's Comet actually travels. It's a very powerful uh, equation. So we have different orbits, different orbital distances, so the semi-major axis is from the center to the edge, the center to the edge, or the center to the edge. Each of these are three different versions of this. And we look at the orbital period, the amount of time it takes to complete one full cycle. It's pretty straightforward as long as we go to circular orbits. Not as easy, but similar for elliptical orbits. So again, we're going to just look at the circular orbit version of this. So start with the force of gravity cause, uh, causing circular motion. So it's kind of the bring everything all together sort of uh, derivation or just looking at how this, this relationship comes into play. So we have gmm over r squared. I've dropped my minus sign, I'm just looking at magnitudes. I know that the circular orbit, this guy, they pull towards each other. That gives me my circular orbit. So my net force, my gravitational force between one object and another object is equal to the mass times the acceleration. And the acceleration just happens to be circular motion. So the moon is uh, is orbiting with some v squared over r. Again, we can start to look at it and we can see, hey, look, this mass will drop. We can start to make some substitutions. One of these r's will drop with this one of these r's. However, before we actually get into all of this, one other bit of information we want. We want how long is a period. Well, a period is determined by how fast we're going around, our velocity, and the circumference. So we know that the amount of time it takes to complete one full cycle, 2 pi r, the circumference of a spherical or a circular orbit, is equal to the velocity we're traveling times the time of one period. Pretty, uh, pretty straightforward. Well, we just rearrange this. So it just says that the velocity is equal to the, two, the circumference divided by the time it takes to complete one circumference. So we combined everything, simplify. As I said, we had one of the radiuses drop out, one of the masses drop out. We get gm over r is equal to v squared. Well, v squared is nothing more than 2 pi r from this equation over t. Substitute in. We're going to start to do some rearranging, and we see that we have r squared here, we have a radius here, so that becomes an r cubed. gm is over here, this 2 pi quantity squared turns into 4 pi squared down here, and t becomes a quantity squared. Well, when we look at it, g times the mass of the Earth, or the mass of our object that we're operating around, or orbiting around, and the 4 pi squared is all constant. So that means r cubed divided by t squared has to be constant as well. Or if we have another radius with another period, doesn't matter the mass of the object that's orbiting it, because that drop, we can get this equation. So 
what are the things that it gives us? What are the things it doesn't give us? Well, what it gives us is that it doesn't matter the object, the mass of the object orbiting, so the moon, the mass of the moon really doesn't matter. It's really the mass of the Earth. So if we put a satellite in orbit and go around, and we want to put it at a certain period, we know using this equation or equivalent this equation, based off of how fast the moon is going, where we should put it. The one limitation we have to remember is that we are only allowed to use this equation where we compare one period and one radius to another period and another radius if we're orbiting the same object. So if we're looking at Jupiter and Earth both orbiting the Sun, we're okay. If we look at the Moon orbiting the Earth and Jupiter orbiting the Sun, because it has a different mass in here, this was derived for the mass of the Earth, but because we're orbiting a different mass, this equation does not ever come into play. So we can't necessarily use this equation for two objects orbiting two different objects. The two objects that are orbiting have to be orbiting the same third object. So this is really a Newton's or Kepler's third law. It's the powerful one, the one that we can use to figure out a lot of calculations. It can tell us that if we know the mass of say a star and we find a planet um, orbiting that, we can figure out how far, if we know how far away it is or its orbital speed, we can figure out the other one with just a basic equation. It also gives us some idea of where to look for other planets that possibly could be orbiting as well. And kind of on a side note, um, the combination of all these and all of Kepler's laws combined and universal gravitational law was actually how we found some some interesting orbits. Uh, we were able to figure out that there were some of our further planets based off of the not complete perfect elliptical orbits from some of the closer in planets. So each of these planets have gravitation pulling from them. Um, and we were able to actually look at the deviations from the predicted from Kepler's laws uh, because we're throwing not only just two objects orbiting, but three, four, five, six, seven objects all interacting with each other, all trying to orbit each other, put it all together, we were actually able to find some of our distant planets. And I believe uh, Pluto, uh, demi, one of the demi planets, was found based off of this information. They looked at the orbit of um, Neptune and saw that it was just a slight variation. And actually, I think Neptune was uh, found in a similar manner. So a lot, of, uh, a lot of good stuff in Kepler's Laws. The third one is normally the one that you go to for finding the most information.